Hello, welcome to the Juice Box Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Benner. This episode is the third in a series with CDE Jenny Smith. If you haven't heard the first two, go back and find them. The first one's called Diabetes Pro Tip, Newly Diagnosed or Starting Over. The second is Diabetes Pro Tip, All About MDI. And this one, of course, Diabetes Pro Tip, All About Insulin. They're designed to be listened to in order. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. What is it about insulin that people need to understand at its core? And I, I'll, I'll start by telling you that uh, just a very simple story that that I was in my nurse practitioner's office one day. You know, I like to say we were at the endo, but honestly, I, I never see the endo. Right. Um, it's always a nurse practitioner who is, yeah, yeah. And most often they've got more time anyway. So that's good. Yeah. When people say, who's your endo? I, I Sometimes I have to pause. I'm like, hmm. Right. Who is the endo? I don't really know. I <laughs> So this was a number of years ago, back before I think I would quote unquote say that I started to understand. And I would say that I've understood diabetes on a different plane for about the last five years or so. Okay. But the run up to understanding it was reaching out into the world and picking these little ideas and, and, and really wrapping my mind around them. And as much as I tried to understand bolusing or understand, you know, the you know, the peaks and the valleys my daughter was seeing and all the problems we were having. It wasn't until the certified diabetes educator in my daughter's practice answered a really simple question for me. I asked her, if you had a magic wand and you could change the way people do one thing around diabetes, what would it be? And without hesitation, she said, I teach them not to be afraid of insulin. She said that would be the core step one Nothing else matters if you're afraid of the insulin. And I took that to heart. So I guess let's start with why are people afraid of insulin? What do you think it is? I think the main reason is because the initial education includes so much about hypoglycemia. Insulin, I mean, insulin is one of the very, very few medications on the market that doesn't have a tremendous amount, but it really doesn't have any effect on anything else. You know, it's not going to cause your eyeballs to turn green or, you know, your toenails to grow extra inches or anything funny, right? It's, it's side effect, let's call it, is hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, if you don't understand how to use insulin, right? right? So that, I mean, it's drilled into you. If you be careful of low blood sugar. This is how to treat low blood sugar. These are symptoms of low blood sugar. I mean, low blood sugar, low blood sugar, low blood sugar is drilled in. And so what are you going to get from that? I mean, if you're told every time you come to the stop sign that some car is going to come and swipe you, you're not going to like going to a stop sign either, are you? <laughs> and I, It's funny. I think of when you say that, I thought of driving in my mind right away and a little differently. I thought of when you first teach someone to drive, you teach them about the brakes, right? Right. It's the it's the it's the first thing you think, right? Like even yeah. if they steer wrong or anything they're doing wrong, if they can stop, maybe they won't get hurt too badly, right? And so it is really the same idea, I guess, for doctors. They look at the giant picture that is type one diabetes, and they say, "What's what's the thing where these people could run into a wall? They could use their insulin incorrectly, cause a scary low. A scary low might mean if you're an adult." Uh, loss of your own function, uh, inability right. to stop that fall from continuing, right? Right. And then, so let's talk about it granularly for a second, because I don't think we do this enough about diabetes. Insulin extracts sugar from your blood. Am I, that right? Yeah. Yeah. And unlike my body, which, knock on wood, has a pancreas that's working, um, it, it uh, my body knows when to stop. It gets me to a nice level and it, yeah. and it stops. Man-made insulin is going to work until it's not there anymore. It's going to work and work and work and work. And it's going to work in an interaction setting with the food that it's meant to work with or the glucose that's in the, in the bloodstream for it to work with. Now, 
there's too much insulin there and there's not enough glucose for it to continue to work with and it's still got a whole hour of action, right. absolutely, low blood sugar. Yep. And it's not going to cause a low blood sugar, like you said. If there's um, impact of carbs, impact of body function, then that's what the insulin's working against. Right. The minute the carbs are gone from your system or the adrenaline you had is gone, this insulin, if it is still there, if you've mistimed it, is going to continue to work. So that we know what we are scared about. Let's be more, more honest about it. I'm going to test myself and you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Sugar is the energy that our brain works off of. It's the, yeah. ga the gas for our brain, right? It is, yeah. And if there's not enough sugar in our blood, our brain shuts off like a light switch. Is that correct? In an easy way of saying it, yes. If our brain is not getting the, that sugar... Yes, we, that's why all of those strange symptoms come about with low blood sugar. Your, your brain is being deprived of the food it needs to function, to think the right way. Yes. Let's just throw it on the table. What everyone's really afraid of, right? Nobody wants to die when they're sleeping. That's what everybody's <laughs> concerned about. Um, I don't want to say that that's not an issue because if it happens to one person, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. I would say that I do think of it again like driving. Like I, I think driving is incredibly dangerous, but I do it every day. Um, if I happen to have an accident one day where I'm killed, I will not be thrilled about that as I see the telephone pole coming for me. Right. But I think that's maybe the cost of doing business for being alive. I have to get around. I have to travel. Right. I think the same thing about diabetes. You need to use the insulin in an effective way to, uh, to make, live. Yeah, make your life healthy, longer, happier, you know, all that stuff. So you have to learn how to do this. And then the rest of it, you, just like driving, you throw it away. You're like, okay, mm -hmm. going out there and I'm going to do my best. The first thing that happens is people get dizzy, confused. Uh, they're easily agitated. But then as your blood sugar continues to drop, you lose the ability to what? Like what happens as you continue to get lower? And again, this is where symptoms are different for everybody. But truly, what can what really continues to happen is the the loss of the right way of thinking. You, it just continues to decline. And if it gets far enough, you could lose consciousness. Right. You know, you you could certainly um, no longer be awake. It doesn't mean doesn't mean death, but it does mean that you could certainly pass out. Um, from a low blood sugar. Which is yeah. why you'll hear adults sometimes say they knew it was coming. They consumed a ton of food, then wake up on the floor because then the food gets in and it turns things around for them. Yeah. So I'm going to, I've said this before, but you know, for context in this episode, prior to technology, I mean, honestly, back when we were needles and a um, little tiny, like I've said before, like a diabetes bubble gum yep. meter, right? I have caused Arden to have two seizures. One right after she was diagnosed, she was only maybe a few months into it. And I had this grand idea that I had figured the whole thing out, which probably meant she was honeymooning. Right. Right. And, and um, we go to the mall one day to pick up some stuff real quickly. My wife's going on a trip and we need a, I think another bag or something. Everybody gets hungry while we're running through the mall. And here's this like mall Chinese food. And I thought this doesn't, uh, no big deal. Right. I'll just count the carbs and I'll shoot the insulin and she'll eat the food. And she ate it and it was good. And she was little, two years old. She ate her a little bit of food. I gave her, you know, not a lot of insulin for a, for a 20 pound person. Right. Bought the bag, went home. She fell asleep in the car, laid her in her crib. My wife and I are helping her. I'm getting her packed up for what she's doing. And then I hear what sounds like a wild animal in my house, grunting and snorting and like, like that. And I go into the room and there's my daughter. She is having a seizure in her crib. And so I pick her up and I don't know what to do. I mean, I know the doctor told us about glucagon, but for the life of me in that moment, I couldn't, I couldn't hold my hand still. I couldn't reconstitute it. It was a disaster. While she's on the floor and my then seven-year-old son is dialing 911 for us, my wife is rubbing glucose gel in her cheeks. And as I'm fumbling with the glucagon and really messing it up, Arden is blind if you touch her, she overreacts in a way like she thinks she's mm -hmm. being shot, like, right? Like it right. scared her. She is grunting and incoherent. And then it just ended. Like yeah. the, the glucose gel worked and she came back and the police came into the house and the 
rescue squad and we went to the hospital and now I look back, we didn't even have to go to the hospital. Like right. the, the hospital was nothing. By the time we got right. there, her blood sugar was back up and she was fine and this whole thing. But it's scary. I mean, just, One you know, just you're saying it, Yeah. you know, I mean, and I talk with and work with so many parents with little, 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 you know, mm-hmm. and it is, it's, a, it's scary when it's, when it's your child and it's not even you, you know? The worst thing. Now, mm-hmm. I, I tell the scary story to tell what I think is the funny story. Yeah. So a year and a half later, we're at Disney for the first time. It's our first time outside in the heat on a big day with diabetes. With diabetes. The mm-hmm. whole day is going great. Again, no CGM, still using needles. End of the night, we're walking back to the hotel, and coming at us is a vendor holding these giant popsicles. <laughs> and I course. remember looking up and seeing them and thinking, we're like 200 yards from the hotel. Like, make a left turn. What are you doing? You, you know, but it's hot out and it's late. And my kids see those and they're like, can we have them? And I thought, sure. I'm going to do what the doctor told me to do. I counted the carbs, I gave her the insulin. And of course it turns out, and I know now, you know, I could have just let her eat in that popsicle. It would have been, it was a fast acting carb. It might've hit her, spiked her a little bit and gone away. Right. She didn't need any of it. But there we are back in the hotel room, packing again, always packing with seizures in my house. And so um, we're packing because we're leaving the next day. She's laying in a bed off in another room, sound asleep. And I hear that noise again. And this time, instead of being confused and thrown off, I say to my wife, Arden's having a seizure. Now, remember, it had been a year and a half since it happened before. And my wife runs and grabs Arden, brings her back. She's holding her. And I have the glucose gel in this squeezy tube. Now, the gel we owned, you had to screw the top off of, then pull the foil thing off that, I guess, keeps yep. it fresh. And then you can use <laughs> right. it. As if gel spoils, oh, right? Right, it's right, like, right. Cheese. Because you never, because, you know, because honestly, now in the, of course, the ensuing 12 years later, we've never, Arden's never had a seizure since then. But, right. so I unscrew the cap and I go to squirt out the gel and I don't pull off the foil cover. And I squeeze it so hard with so much enthusiasm that a <laughs> pinhole breaks on the opposite side of the thing. And I'm squeezing it. I'm like, what's going on? And then I look up. And on the ceiling of the hotel room is a kaleidoscope of gel I'm shooting all over the ceiling. So I don't even pause. I flip the thing upside down, and now I just squirt it from the pinhole into Arden's mouth. We rub it around. She wakes up. We put, you know, get everything straight, put her back to bed. We were traveling with my brother when it was all over. And to say that it might have been a four-minute experience, right? When it was all over, I look in the corner, and my brother is cowering in the corner, <laughs> just with a look on his face, like he can't believe what he just saw. And my wife and I look up and see the gel on the ceiling. We crack up laughing, wipe off the ceiling, clean it up, and go back to packing. His experience is a good example right. of of the fear. That's exactly right. Because no matter how much I explained it to him, and I said, look, you know, I don't want to call this the cost of doing business, but we've never been in this situation before. We're completely blind. We don't know what our blood sugar's doing. I think the point is this. And my point is this. I, I don't think my point is this. I know my point is this. I don't want Arden to have a seizure. But in, geez, 2 to 15, in 13 years of having type 1 diabetes, it's happened twice. It was both when she was tiny. It was both when I didn't know what I was doing. And it was well before the technology that exists now. And before experience of walking around, I mean, in this example, walking around a park all day and not really knowing, hey, I, she can probably get away with having this little bit of extra sugar. She'll climb. She'll come back down. The exercise is going to hit all night long. Yes. She doesn't need insulin. You didn't know that. I had no idea. And now I do. And now mm-hmm. Arden can go play softball for nine hours on a 105 degree day and she doesn't get low at the end of the day. Right. And Because now I know what I'm doing. But the right. fear that exists, exists for that reason. And so... I don't know how comfortable you are talking about this because I haven't asked you ahead of time, but how real, and this, then we'll get off the fear and we'll move on to other stuff about insulin, but how real is the concern that I'm going to go to bed one night and not wake up the next day? I would say that the concern, it's a real concern. Absolutely, it is. Is it a concern that it could happen wildly out of the blue with and I bring this up with the technology we have today. Mm-hmm. 
I would say that piece is a, it's not going to be as common. Okay. Um, and it's not because we have alarms and things that set. Now, is technology always perfect? No. I mean, we can get alarms and alerts for blood sugars that are ultra low or look like they've dropped off the map and you do a finger stick and it's that the sensor was not right. You know, it was a, you know, a kind of a compression low. Or you could have a low alert and you could actually be lower than the low alert already, right? However, the fear of going to bed and not waking up while I would believe that it's there for 90% of people with diabetes. The other percent maybe don't even think about it or know yeah. that it's a potential, again, education piece there. But I think that there is the knowing about insulin and action going into that time of the night. I think that's a piece that can really help to prevent that from happening. Right. As we move forward, you'll hear me say a number of times that I think that highs cause lows. Because highs create situations where you have unbalanced insulin. Yeah. And, and eventually, like we talked about earlier, body function, uh, blood sugar will, will be pushed away by the insulin that's there, leaving more insulin behind. And, and there are a lot of times that people will say to me, uh, you know, I, I get low at 2 a.m. Or, you know, it always happens. And I think, well, I don't know that you get low at 2 a.m. It's very possible that something's happening hours before or you're using yeah. insulin hours before. And it's and and this is what the residual of that, right? And so when you use insulin more thoughtfully, I guess is the word. Correct. I'm right. Yeah, that's a great word. You don't have as much of it laying around later in your body that has nothing to do except for to make you low. Correct. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we get to that as we speak. We've addressed fear in insulin. It's a real thing. It, it exists for most people. There's good reasons why you should be afraid. But how do we stop people from being afraid? But I think the fear too, and just to kind of clarify there, it's okay to be afraid, but it's also really important that you do something to understand and, and be able to get rid of the fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it will be there. It is certainly, but it's important to learn how to not worry so much with the fear. Right. Let it overtake you. I think of it. Let it overtake you. Just yeah. like they tell you with fire when you're three years old, you have to, right. you're, you're, you have to respect fire, but you can't be afraid of it. Right. You can't be afraid of it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's what I do. I, I, it was the first leap that I made that brought me to the place where I am now. And I think that, I think that no matter what tools you give people, if they're afraid to use them, it kind of it's never going to work out quite right. And it's always going to become unbalanced. They're always going to end up in a situation where they go, see, look, this is diabetes is unpredictable. And, and th this is always going to happen. And then, yeah. you know, and that, that's that. So, okay. So, all right. So what's the first step to not being afraid? It's got to be understanding how to use the insulin, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So we're going to get a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. So let's understand a couple of things first that the insulin can do that cause issues for people. And one, right. People say I started using insulin and I started gaining weight. Mm. Okay. Now, very recently I had an interview with Chris Rudin where Chris said, that's not as really nearly as much about the insulin as, as, as it is about calories. And that was his take on it. Like if you eat extra calories, you're going to gain weight. And that a lot of times we have low blood sugars that we treat with food, but we don't think of that food as, as food. being excess. Yeah, we think of it as, as necessary because it is in the right. moment because you're low. Right. But what is the act? What is the what is the the technical reason why people see weight gain with insulin? Elizabeth Forrest was diagnosed with type one diabetes at ten years old. Then a student in Holly Ricker's dance class. Elizabeth decided to start a nonprofit organization. Now, this wasn't something that she had considered previously, but either was being diagnosed with type 1. But after her diagnosis, she was driven to not let diabetes negatively impact her life, and she was inspired to start Dancing for Diabetes. She did this as a way to bring attention to the stories of the 1.25 million Americans who are living every day with type 1, and to offer support to those who have been diagnosed. And on top of all that, she's raising funds to find a cure. 
What started as a community fundraiser organized by a middle school student and a small group of trusted advisors has blossomed into a full-scale theatrical production involving hundreds of local dancers and community supporters. Dancing for Diabetes has been impacting people through dance for almost 20 years. It has grown from a middle school auditorium to filling Orlando's Bob Carr Theater and is well considered one of Orlando's premier charity entertainment events of the year. I spoke last year at one of their events and had such an amazing time that I'm going back again in 2019. Elizabeth doesn't have a ton of money to do advertising, but she wants to spread the word about Dancing for Diabetes, which is why you hear during some of our episodes, I just pop in and say the name really quickly. They're trying to build awareness for their organization while building a better future for people with type 1. So you've heard me say it before, and I'm going to say it right here. Go to dancingfordiabetes.com. That's dancing, the number four, diabetes.com. Check out what they're doing. It'll put a smile on your face, and maybe you'll decide to get involved. Real Good Foods believes in making delicious foods, high in protein, low in carbs, that are made from real ingredients, so you can feel the goodness. You'll never find weird-sounding words on their ingredients labels, nor will you find processed grains, flours, or other fillers. For example, instead of flour, their single-serve pizza crust is made from two ingredients, all-natural chicken breast and Parmesan cheese. Real Good Foods' family-sized cauliflower pizza crust is made from cauliflower, egg, and cheese. And all of their foods are grain-free, gluten-free, and use natural ingredients. That includes my wife's favorite enchiladas, the poppers that I love so much, the chicken crust pizza Arden adores, and the cauliflower pizza that my mom can't get enough of. For being a listener of the Juice Box Podcast, Real Good Foods would like to offer you 20% off of your entire order. All you have to do at checkout is use the offer code JUICEBOX. And as if that wasn't enough, they also have free two-day shipping. Let's hold up some of Real Good Foods products against popular competitors. Their margarita cauliflower pizza has 9 grams of carbs and 20 grams of protein. That other pizza that you know about has 37 grams of carbs and only 12 grams of protein. Real Good Foods Enchiladas has 4 grams of carbs, 20 grams of protein, and that other one that you know about has 18 grams of carbs and 9 protein. Now on to the poppers. There must be even somewhere, right? Nope, not even close. 3 grams of carbs for Real Good Foods, 29 for the competitor, and protein, 22 to 4. You can use the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com for both Dancing for Diabetes and Real Good Foods. And don't forget when you get to realgoodfoods.com to use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout to save 20%. Why do some people see weight gain with insulin? The easy answer there is that the insulin is being it's being mismanaged. The dosing of it is being mismanaged. And mismanaged why? That takes in-depth analysis of what's going on in the person's individual setting, Mm -hmm. right? And I work with a lot of people, weight management-wise, type 1, who, you know, I just, I've gained weight, or I've done this, my blood sugars are now better, but I've gained weight. Now, if, to start with, if you're running really consistently high blood sugars, you're actually peeing out calories. Okay. You're peeing out glucose because that's how your body is trying to get rid of the excess because there's not enough insulin there to bring it into your body and, and utilize it. Right. So you may be maintaining a, a weight that you love. Your blood sugars are high. That, it's not healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, on the second side, once you do rein in control and you're now taking insulin to contain blood sugars, you may be gaining weight because your body is now retaining some of those calories that were being lost before that you didn't realize, right? So that comes then to the point of understanding lifestyle and the management of insulin. Mm -hmm. And I bring up a really important piece that people don't, people don't realize. Um, Insulin's job is, is a storage hormone. Insulin's job is to pack the food into different places in the body, right? It either packs it and moves it into your muscle cells or it packs it and moves it into fat, right? It's usable or it's going to be hopefully used later. (laughs) 
if there's too much of it, your body has to pack it away and, and utilize it later. So that's a that's a lifestyle piece. That's something to look at and say, okay, where's my activity level? Where does my nutrition intake need to be? Is my insulin matching that? Am I driving my glucose values too low? And like you said, am I taking in too much because of low blood sugars that are consistently happening? And then you're adding more insulin to correct the high that follows. And then you're dropping and you're adding food and you're correcting and add. So it becomes this vicious cycle of management if you don't understand how insulin works. And in a body, I think a good point is that in a body without diabetes, insulin plays a very big role in weight management. And people without diabetes aren't injecting it. Their pancreas is making it. So if they're themselves not managing lifestyle, they're having to produce a heck of a lot more insulin to bring food out of their bloodstream for their body to maintain that normal blood sugar the way that it's meant to do. They will likely gain weight too. Right. So do me a favor and go over that cycle for a second. I take something in through my mouth that has carbohydrates in it. It goes into my stomach, my my body begins to break it down. It, it basically those carbs are leached out, that sugar, which is, you know, you know sugar is carbs, the sugar comes mm-hmm. out and the insulin actually helps it go into my blood, right? It, or how does it? The insulin takes, um, insulin, you know, we take it, we inject it or we pump it into our sub Q tissue. It gets absorbed. And dissipates that into our bloodstream is, I guess, the easiest way to say how it works. Insulin in the bloodstream then matches with the glucose from the food that we've eaten in whatever form. You know, it could be rice, it could be celery, it could be an apple, whatever it is. Sugar in the bloodstream. Um, the insulin kind of combines with the glucose. They, they latch on together. Mm-hmm. And insulin is then the key to the door on the cells. Um, with insulin, the doors open, the key unlocks the door on the cell, the glucose is allowed to enter the cell, muscle cells then use it for energy, fat cells pack it away. Right. So that's how it works. Right. And so with, so without insulin, we go into DKA, right? And so, and DKA is, what is it technically? But what, what is it that's happening? So technically with DKA, it's a, it's a significant deficit of insulin with high blood sugars, okay. right? Now, there are cases of DKA at more normal blood sugars. Mm-hmm. Um, the DKA, however, really is it's a deficit of insulin, meaning that your body is, has no way to clear the glucose out of the bloodstream and move it into the places it needs to go. Now, your body tries to compensate. Like I mentioned before with the weight management piece, your body tries to compensate. You get really, really thirsty with higher blood sugars. Right. You take in more fluids. Your body, you pee because you're drinking more, right. and your body is trying to flush a lot of that extra glucose out in the only way it can. If It can't do that forever, though, at a deficit of insulin. Right. And so your body at the point of not having energy from glucose, it starts to break down fats and proteins. So ketones are produced with the breakdown of fat. Right. Is that why when I think back on Arden's diagnosis prior to it, she was ravenously hungry at the end? Because she, her body was starving and it's telling her, eat, we're starving, except the food went in and then there was no insulin to move it into the cells where it was needed. Correct. Correct. I mean, I could have, I remember, I mean, I was older than your daughter and I very, I very much remember the two weeks leading up, especially the week leading up to my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I very much remember it. I mean, I, at the lunch table at school with my friends, I was asking them, for their milk. I was so thirsty and so hungry. And so they would, they would get two milks and, and they would one. bring one for me. I mean, I was consuming probably six of those little cartons of milk at every lunch. And wow. between classes in the hallway, I needed to get to the water fountain. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, the unquenchable thirst and hunger. Right. Oh, wow, that's crazy. It really is. Um, it threw me off for a second thinking about okay. it. No, no, I was yeah. thinking back on Arden's diagnosis and it, it just, uh, 
it always just makes me think like, how did I not see her dying? Cause she was, you, you know, yeah. like, like no insulin in her body and she was withering away and you look back. Well, at a two year old, so it is, I think for kids it's hard too, because kids are hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a two year old and a six year old and man, like every hour they're like, I'm hungry, grab this. I am hungry. Can I have that? I, kids are hungry, yeah. but it's a different, it's a very different ravenous in and, that setting. Oh my God. Yeah. And so let me ask you something. When a blood sugar starts to get low with a person who's being managed, but maybe they have their, their insulin's unbalanced and they're getting lower. Arden will say she's hungry prior to a low blood sugar. And yeah. I always tell her, Hey, if you feel hungry, first thing we should think about is, is it, is, are you hungry, hungry, or is your blood sugar getting lower about to get low? Same function right there. Uh, in a, in a similar way, um, just in an opposite, you know, high blood sugars, you're hungry because your body is starving mm -hmm. for the energy, right? Okay. And it's not getting it. Low blood sugars, you're hungry because, again, as we talked about initially, your brain is being deprived. Okay. Your brain is saying, hey, you're hungry. There's not enough Go food. Go grab energy something. There's enough, not enough food here. I, there's, there's too much of this insulin. It's calling. And sometimes even that precipitous drop in blood sugar that can happen. That's why the overindulgence the yeah, yeah, yeah. is there with lows. I mean, you could literally go to the refrigerator and eat the whole refrigerator. I mean, there are, there are people who have done that or just the yeah. whole box of cereal. Right. And they're like, okay, where's the next box? Yeah. You know? It's, yeah. And it's uh, commonly referred to as eat the kitchen. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so, but when Arden was younger and before sensor technology, and I was staring at her trying to figure out ways to understand where her blood sugar was, one of them was if she said she was hungry at what I thought were odd times of day, I thought, ooh, she might be low. And yeah, yeah because the looking for the bags under their eyes was not working. I, I'll never oh. forget, she's diagnosed and, uh, the, the nurse practitioner goes, you know, dark circles under the eyes could be signs of low blood sugar. And then she paused and she goes, or high blood sugar. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what's, what's, what's that going to help me? And by the way, it never came to fruition. I, I spent yeah, no. the, I've spent the first year of her diagnosis staring at her face, looking for a sign of something wrong with her blood sugar. And it doesn't exist. I have never heard that before, Scott. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. I so, have never heard that as a symptom of high or low. <laughs> and it makes me think of the insanity of like when Arden will say to me, like, you know, you'll be in the middle of a, a CGM changeover and I'll say, Hey, look, it's been an hour since we reset the CGM or since we put it on, whatever. Why don't you go ahead and test? Let's just make sure we, yeah. we are where we think sure. And she'll say, I feel fine. And I always go, ironically, how you feel is not the best indication of what your blood sugar is. <laughs> and so, and so she still won't wrap, she still doesn't wrap her head around that right away. If she feels okay, then she thinks I'm okay, y you know? Well, and there are some children that have not quite even gotten to the point of realizing what the difference of body feeling is, Yeah. right? Um, and if they've lived with diabetes long enough, they may not necessarily know what quote unquote normal but should feel like, like this is, right? Yep. They may not know that. And you diagnosis at two or three, they're not even realizing outside of like an earache that they're like screaming in pain or they're pointing at their mouth because their tooth hurts or whatever it might be. Kids that young are not in tune with how their body's supposed to feel. And, and associating it with, oh, I'm low, mommy, or I have a high blood sugar. And so then moving on through life, because they've had diabetes from such an early age, when you do start to make those connections, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to translate that then into, you know, older age. Right. So I, I was, it's funny you brought that up because this was going to be my next question for you. So I just uh, was interacting with somebody on Instagram who, you know, found the podcast is bringing their blood sugar down and now nice. they, they have a beautiful, stable 85 blood sugar where they feel dizzy. Yeah. And, okay. Now, so I'm talking to this woman and she says, I'm going to ignore it. I know it's not real. Like I know I'm not in trouble, so I'm just going to power through. I'm, maybe I'll give myself a little bit of carbs to, you know, kind of help it a little bit, but I'm going to power through it because I know my body's going to adjust to this. And I spoke to a different person who said that they got to that that nice, stable, good number, and they stopped themselves from eating too much. 
but it's still that they had trouble doing it. So my question is, when you've spent such a long time with an elevated blood sugar, you know, thinking 180 was a great day, right. uh, you know, or you're 250 for six of the hours of the day, and you finally get this all under control, you keep listening to these podcast episodes, and you get to a place where you're 85 and stable. When that first happens, you feel like you're low. What's the function of that, first of all, and tell people that it's going to get better, please. Yeah, the, I mean, the function of that is because your body is having to adjust to values that it hasn't seen as the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, an average of 180, an average of 200, an average of 250, while it's high, you you may feel normal at that because you don't know what a normal value or a target value feels like. Right. So as you start to notch things down, your body has to readjust to that new normal value. And it does take some time. So hovering, you know, now at even 110 for somebody who is averaging 200, they may feel low. Okay. That may very well feel low. It doesn't mean it needs treatment because it's truly not a low value, but it does feel low. And so it's hard. It's hard to work through that don't know, but I can imagine. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. So I, you know, I think as far as CGM, especially, I think that's, that's good technology now that at least they can also see where things are going. I mean, if they're at 110 feeling low and they're all where all right, they're consistently still dropping very much, especially, you know, finger stick wise, they might be lower than that. Yeah. Um, if they're on a trend, if they're hovering nice and stable, nice horizontal line at 110. You don't need to treat that. You got to fight through it. How long does it, I, I realize it'll be different for everybody, but what's the average amount of time before a uh, stable in range blood sugar starts feeling normal? Usually at least a couple weeks. I mean, from starting, you know, and depending on time frame of how long things were higher, mm -hmm. it may take a couple of weeks for that to feel normal at those lower in target values. And again, stability there. And lacking this big jump up and down and whatnot, mm -hmm. that makes a difference for resetting those symptoms in your body. Okay. I have one last question, and then we're going to move on to something else. Can I show you my line right now? Yeah, sure. But look at you. Okay, I'm looking at, at, at Jenny's six-hour Dexcom line that looks like it's been right at 100. It might have dipped to, was that, where's your low at, 60 or 70? My low is at 70. At 70. It hit 70 for a little while, maybe for about an hour, and then it banged up 80, 85. This is very pretty. Good for you. Thanks. Are we, are we, <laughs> are we, are we, uh, are we going to compare? Let me, let me compare. So... Arden has one compression low in the last 12 hours that isn't real. But other than that, let's see if you can see that. Very nice. Thank you. She's even averaging lower than me right now. Wow. And we, it's, a new, it's a new pump, too. So. Oh, it's a new pump. Yeah, we got, we got the best day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know those pod change days are like, it's almost like magic. Well, can be almost like magic. Um, I actually just so. walked through, uh, walk somebody through uh, how to pod change without a high, and we'll talk about that when we talk about pumping. But yeah, so here's my last question about insulin. It's, and I'm going to go back to something scary for a second, but I think it's uh, well, I know how impactful it was for me. So back when I had to dispense with my fear of insulin, like we talked about at the beginning, how do you do that, right? Like, how do you make a leap like that? For me, and it would probably be different for a lot of people. I started thinking more about long-term health. I realized that the doctor was telling me to leave Arden's blood sugar high so that she wouldn't get low. We were trading today's health for tomorrow's, right? Like we won't die today, but we might not live a long, healthy life either. Right. And I thought that can't be okay. But I still couldn't make the leap. And finally, I thought about it in as technical and scientific a way as my brain would allow. And what I, what I came to, to think about was I actually spilled some sugar out on the table and I looked at how kind of coarse and granular and sharp it was on its edges. And I thought, well, at its, you know, at its microscopic like existence, it's probably still coarse and sharp like this. And our bodies are built to handle a certain amount of it flowing through our blood. But if you pack that blood with too much, 
that must be, and this was me thinking my way through when people say, um, I, he died of a heart attack, you know, because of his diabetes or he went blind because of his diabetes or he couldn't feel his foot anymore. What that really means is that the sugar has basically sandblasted you from the inside. Damaging. Right. Making Absolutely. damage to the inside of your veins, capillaries, all the places where blood's covered, right? If you have a heart attack and they say it was because of diabetes, it's because the flesh in your heart got rubbed thin and it burst. And and you know, and beyond that, mm-hmm. beyond that are the other the other pieces of those complications such as heart disease right. that come about. And most doctors don't teach this. Yeah. Um, and I think, it, you know, it may be a time thing. It may be that they don't want to get the in-depth piece of it, yeah. I think. It might be but a bad I, thing to bring up on day three of your diagnosis. On day three, yeah. right, yeah. exactly. Hey, but you're I, sandblasting yourself. So I have a good, and I wish that I could show this to everybody, but this is a tube full of a glucose solution. Do you see how slowly those little there's supposed to be particles of sugar are flowing through the bloodstream, yes. sugar or nutrients, mm-hmm. right? I like to refer to them as nutrients because this is the other piece to overall long, long health with diabetes is, as you mentioned, glucose. I love your rough part of that right. example because it is high glucose levels cause your um, cause your blood to get thick, almost like molasses in winter, mm-hmm. okay? which means that all of the nutrients in your bloodstream are also flowing very slowly to all the places in your body that need to get those wonderful micro macronutrients. Okay. So healing and everything gets slowed if your glucose level stays high. The the roughness of that sugar that you talk about or the high glucose values, it is. It's very damaging to vessels. It almost creates like rust on a car. It creates damage on the inside of the vessels. Your body tries to heal itself. It's a self-healing machine. Your body actually makes cholesterol. It's like a Mm -hmm. Band-Aid. So even if you never ate cholesterol again, your liver is meant to make cholesterol. And cholesterol is like, it does a lot of other things, but it is also a patch. The more damage, the more patch. You see how narrow... Right. My vessel is now getting yep. the more and more patches. Those vessels that narrow, that leads to high blood pressure. High blood pressure damages your kidneys. High blood pressure puts um, a lot of pressure on the vessels in your eyes. So it's a it's a snowball effect right. with consistently maintained high blood sugars. Now, have a 200 blood sugar because you decided to eat the whole, you know, Disney princess cake or whatever and then you bring that blood sugar down that's that's a different story than this consistent maintenance of high glucose that's different yeah right i I think that when people when i say that arden's a1c has been between five two and six two for five years i think people imagine a steady 85 blood sugar forever which is not the case no right she spikes up just like everyone else you know if you're gonna if you're gonna eat with diabetes and not have you know you know, not, not have boiled it down to low carb or no carb or something like that. Right. You're going to miss sometimes. I miss on boluses, you know, uh, insulin pump sets aren't as effective on day three as they are on day one. There's reasons why, right? Yeah. So it, it really is, it, I, it, it's not a perfection you're looking for. It's a, it's a fluidity, a fluidity. It's a consistency to how you manage. That's what keeps your A1C low. Right. As you were describing cholesterol coming in and making patches on, you know, arteries or veins and it, in it thinning, you know, that's what people would commonly think of as needing a stent in their heart, right? Like eventually it has to open up that space again. Right. So for me, back to what I started to say, I got past the fear by saying to myself, I can't let my fear of something happening to Arden today affect her entire life. Right. I just can't do that. And, and if that means she's going to have something bad happen to her or my life's going to be a little more hectic managing insulin, then that's got to be what it's got to be. Right. Because the alternative is I put all this effort and heart and love into my daughter. And at the end of my life, when I'm 65, 70, 80 years old, and I'm looking back at my 40 year old daughter and she's in incredibly poor health, I'm going to think like, what, what was this all for? 
Like, you, you know what I mean? Like what I spend my whole life doing. So I'd rather right. get in the game now and do the best I can, let the chips fall where they may a little bit, um, then just to ignore it. I can't, I am not across that bridge when it comes to it person. I find, right. I find when you think about life like that, people have heard me talk about it on the show before you get a bill in the mail, you can't afford it. And you know, you can't before you open up the envelope, just open it anyway. Right. Be an adult and go, I owe the electric company $400. Like, like know that. It's not going to be better tomorrow. It's going to be the same bill. Absolutely. It's the (laughs) same idea with your blood sugar. Like, don't ignore it. Don't say to yourself, it's okay. I'll deal with it later because later is going to be worse. Now sucks. Later is worse. So get in the game, do it now. I've always thought about um, myself personally. I've always thought about all the things that I am able to do because because I choose to manage, because I have chosen to understand how to manage. Um, I mean, I, I, I've i done a lot of awesome things. I've had two kids. I, you know, I want to see those kids grow up. Right. I want to be around with them. And I, I, that that is the biggest thing to look out to future-wise and remember every day. Yeah. And it that, is. And that's why you and I are doing this, like, series inside of a it's a it's a series of podcast episodes inside of a podcast, right? Right. It's because somebody's going to hear that and think, yeah, that's nice, buddy, but I don't know how to keep my kid's blood sugar at 70 and blah, blah. But I'm telling you, we're going to talk about how to do that in a way where you don't have to – when you hear the idea of keeping your blood sugar stable to a lower number, it doesn't make you think, well, that's impossible. It, uh, we're we're going to talk about the tools that make it possible. And um, I'll leave this episode with this thought. Three nights ago, a man in his 40s, I saw him on Facebook, and he was basically begging people. He was at the end of his rope, and he had had diabetes for a long time, and it was just not going well. And people were all jumping in, giving them, giving him their best piece of advice. And I always think the same thing when I see people on social media. I'm like, wow, that's valuable. But how do you make sense of it? You know, then somebody will right. say something else and I go, well, that's not really that valuable at all in this situation, but I right. see why it's well-meaning. And so then the person's frazzled to the point where they thought to reach out into the world to strangers, right? <laughs> and now these strangers are throwing 20 ideas at them. None of them are cohesive, even if they're good. And so I just couldn't take it. And I, I stepped in and I said, if you want to message me, I'll see if I can help you with this. And there were very kind people who all jumped on and said, I would message Scott if I was you. So we got, on the, we got on the phone and 45 minutes later, we got off of the phone. And the next morning, he sent me his steady overnight graph. And Aww. at the end of that day, he sent me his steady day graph and the next day and the next day. And my point is, I can't talk to all of you on the phone and Jenny can't speak to every one of you personally. <laughs> But I think we can give you enough tools to get you to that spot. So, so keep going with the with this um, series, and I think you're going to be happy that you did. I hope you're enjoying the series. I want to take a moment to thank the sponsors: Dancing for Diabetes, Real Good Foods, and even though they weren't mentioned in this episode, Dexcom and Omnipod. There are links in your show notes and at JuiceBoxPodcast.com to all of the sponsors. But you can always go to Dancing the Number Four Diabetes.com realgoodfoods.com use the offer code juicebox dexcom.com slash juicebox or myomnipod.com slash juicebox to find out more and don't forget that jenny does this for a living and you can find out more about her services at integrateddiabetes.com this episode with jenny smith is of course part of a series if you missed the first two there was diabetes pro tip newly diagnosed or starting over and diabetes pro tip all about MDI. This, of course, was Diabetes Pro Tip, all about insulin. Now, if you enjoyed these episodes and found them useful, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a review. Over the next few weeks, you'll get the same interview style episodes that you've come to enjoy. And then towards the end of the month, three more episodes coming your way. All about bolusing, basal rates, pumping, glucose monitoring, the next steps in this bigger picture. And when Jenny and I finish with these 10 episodes, it's our goal for them to be a roadmap, sort of a blueprint for how to use insulin and manage day-to-day with type 1. I also imagine that there may be times during conversational episodes where you hear an idea brought up and you may be able to come back to these episodes for, you know, a refresher 
on the concept. Thank you very much for listening to the Juicebox Podcast. I'll see you next week.